The following content is for information and entertainment purposes only. The opinions expressed in this episode are those of the participants and do not represent the views of any third party entities. Welcome to the fifth installment of the Minisodes, a companion show to the main flexibility focused podcast in which I interview people doing great things in the health and fitness industry. In this edition, I talk with Ollie Frost, a movement coach and co-founder of Move 45, a program that aims to improve the human experience through breathwork and by increasing the quality of foundational movements. We discuss many different topics, ranging from where to start if you have no formal movement training, whether coaches should adopt a joint first or a patterns first approach to training, the increasing awareness of fascia and its integral role in quality movement, and so much more. My thanks go to Ollie for giving his time and energy to this show, as well as to all my other previous guests who have given their time so generously. The feedback I've received regarding the interviews has been incredibly positive, and I'm grateful to every audience member who leaves a comment or sends a message telling my guests and I just how much they got from our talks. These interviews are actually my favourite part of the podcasting process because I think it's important for you to hear voices other than my own and the people I've interviewed thus far have been experts in their own ways far better than I could ever hope to be. I'm a firm believer that collaboration trumps competition every time so again thank you from the bottom of my heart to all my guests who have been so willing to participate in that collaborative process. A new episode of the main podcast will be going out in the next few days, followed by some more interviews which I think you'll really enjoy. As always, please like and leave a comment if you can, and please share the show with your friends. That's enough from me, let's get on with the interview. Ollie, welcome to Flexibility Focus. Thanks, Dan, for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. Yeah, same here, mate, same here. Um, can you start by telling us how you first became involved in the, in the fitness industry and how your career evolved to where it is now? So I started um, dancing as a, a youngster, so I did lots of dancing in theatre, mainly contemporary dancing, uh, which moved into a little bit of break dancing. Um, alongside that, um, I played rugby, religiously and um, that was a massive passion of mine got to sort of 16 went to college stopped dancing had to make a bit of a decision which, which was fairly hard at the time um, and then I left college and then I did then I was fortunate to play professional rugby from 18 to 26 um, when I was 18 I did my uh, level three um, PT CYQ um, personal trainer award um, I didn't really use it at the time. I did a little bit of coaching uh, in the Nuffield in Worcester where I was playing rugby. Um, I then moved down to London and then I stopped playing rugby when I was 25, 26. And then I joined um, Reach Fitness in Clapham. And then more recently, I'm part of a physio practice called Balance, which is in southwest London. Uh, and I rent space there. And over the last five years, I've become really, really interested in movement practice and movement coaching uh, having had the movement kind of side of it when I was growing up and then having a massive block of almost 10 years of no movement really apart from lifting weights um, so I left rugby fairly stiff not very mobile and um, in a really sort of um, bit of a cross pass where I wanted to take my own training and own coaching and this reignited my whole kind of um, uh, passion and feeling towards helping people move better through the power of movement great yeah that's brilliant um so i've looked on your profile you've got something called move 45 um could you tell us a little bit more about that so move 45 is a um it's a new lifestyle program which is developed by me and my business partner elliot moja um elliot is the former founder of um, lift london which is a gymnastic space in east london um and me and elliot share the same views on helping people move better through the power of movement. Um, and Move 45 isn't just, we believe a movement program is a, it's an all encompassing lifestyle program, um, which involves a breath control, um, their movement patterns, and then also their lifestyle. So we're just trying to tie in the stresses of the everyday life, mm -hmm. um, how they can move better. And that's also linked through their breath control as well. Um, we're starting with corporate businesses at the moment online due to this period of lockdown um, but with the view that we'd like to work with um, 
uh, different demographics, including sort of elderly people, potentially care homes, obviously, when it's safe to work with them, and also potentially some disadvantaged kids or groups, and um, really try and make what we do universal to everyone, um, and just spread the message on how to move better, how to be more healthy, and how to be more human. Brilliant, yeah. I really like the fact as well you're touching on, like, people in care homes and, uh, you know, disadvantaged populations as well, because I think with society, it's once somebody's in a care home, they're almost forgotten about. And it's like, you know, those people still need a quality of life. And we almost forget that movement incorporates, it is incorporated in that as well. So I think that's great. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing where you take that. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, it's so important to keep moving until you're however old and it keeps us healthy and it keeps us mobile. And it's, you know, it's just part of everyday life. And I don't think anyone should be forgotten about along the way. Yeah, brilliant. So, um, I know one of the biggest obstacles that um, beginners have is where to start. So say that you've got a client who is middle-aged and they have no movement experience or sports background whatsoever. Uh, how would you approach uh, developing movement with them when they first come to see you? So I think the first thing I would look at is, is their breath control and their awareness. So if they come and see me and I do some basic breath control tests, and if I see that they're using their mouth to breathe quite a lot, that would indicate that they're not really using their nose to breathe. So when you're using your mouth um, inherently throughout the day to breathe, you're going to be delivering lots of internal stress to your brain that is in a fight and flight situation. So when you're offloading too much air in the form of carbon dioxide, this is sending an internal stress messenger to your central nervous system that you're, you're about to basically do something, which is, you know, fight and flight sort of situation. Mm -hmm. This can, however, have a, you know, not a good effect if the accumulation is over the days and the weeks and the months. And this becomes a stressful situation internally. Um, and the physical effects of mouth breathing are the fact that you'll have a lot of t um, tension and tightness around your thorax and through your ribcage, which will... Um, negate movement mm. so the first thing I do is talk to them about the power of breath and movement starts with the breath and it's you know this invisible air of oxygen and carbon dioxide which we don't really talk about you know we, we're born we breathe and then we don't hear anything about it you do the odd PT session you get the whole like brace you know don't breathe breathe out you know and it's just yeah. kind of a bit of a gray area and it's um it's a massive tool which we can do as coaches to empower people to live and be healthy it almost um straight away so i'll look at someone's breathing are they a chronic chest breather which obviously would in indicate not just tissue tightness but maybe some anxiety uh, they might have some breathing functions like asthma so if we can control their breath they're already going to be in a good place to start a movement program mm -hmm. um, in terms of the physical side of it in in the early stages i'll look at them do really basic tasks so body weight squat can they do cat cow? Can they just roll on the floor fluidly? Can they extend their limbs to different directions without a huge amount of restriction? And that's going to show to me that they're quite fluid movers. And then we can kind of tailor it to be, you know, more goal driven. But the basis is, do they breathe properly? Are they posturally sound? And can they move unloaded through various directions of movement without restrictions? You know, things I look at are, do they tense their jaw a lot? When they move, do they hold tightness in their neck? Um, I'll look at their feet. You know, I'll come on to that in a second as well. But more so, do they have basic awareness of how 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 the feet are in space and how how is how is their perception of their own body in space? Um, so it's building an, an understanding with that client and empowering them to be more movement competent to move forward. Brilliant. Yeah. No, I think that that's fantastic. I mean, especially the focus on the breath as well. You know, like you say, we we're born, we breathe, and then we forget about it until yeah. you know we're, we're trying to do a max effort squat or we're running to catch the bus. Um, yeah, I think that yeah, that's really good. Uh, from a flexibility perspective, I'll get people come to me and they'll say, "I want to do the split." So how do I do this loaded stretch? And my first question to them is, "Well, how do you breathe in the side split first? Uh, well, what do you mean?" So one of the first um, techniques that I use, um, I think Pavel Satsulin called it contrast breathing which is just, you know, altering tension based on the breath. And if you can't control your, you know, your breathing and tension through breathing, then don't even bother with isometric contractions or loaded stretching just yet. First focus on your breathing, you know. Definitely. Like what you mentioned then is stretching, especially in those end ranges, is quite stressful for your body anyway. So 
if you can provide your nervous system with you know a, a degree of safety and that comes from using your diaphragm properly loading the diaphragm enabling the rib cage to laterally expand and you know, you're going to be negating that internal stress messenger of carbon dioxide that you're in control so when you're in the middle splits and it's like okay this is really really hard but let's just breathe slowly, let's use a quiet exhale, let's keep the mouth closed, and then let's allow the nervous system to almost accept and relax this new required range of motion. So it takes practice, it's hard, um, but it's something I think everyone can feel the benefits of almost straight away. And it just builds awareness around your internal environment to then obviously create a better external. Yeah, brilliant. Um, this next question, I think you've already kind of touched on it, but yeah. um, in your opinion, what would be some of the fundamental movement patterns or positions that everyone should try to develop in order to function more like a human being is supposed to function like? So I think I don't have a like a rigid set, um, set of skills or movements, but I would just put it under the umbrella of basic movement literacy. So do they have the ability to um, roll on the floor? Do they have the ability to hang? for a prolonged period of time? Can they do a rest and body weight squat? Can they have, um, and do they have spinal freedom? Do they have the articulation between their spine, almost, you know, sort of biomorphic shapes of the spine? Can, can the spine move freely through all the planes, through rotation, through flexion, and, and does it feel stiff? And if I look at someone, if they go into a side bend and I see the rib cage is quite stiff and tight, then I will maybe link it back to their history. You know, do they have a breathing dysfunction? what's their day-to-day -day lifestyle, like what's their, you know, their most common posture. So I think as a, a coach, I just try and empower people to move in as many different directions as possible with as much fluid movement as possible, almost you know, like Bruce Lee, like water, and just trying to implement this mindset of letting go and being able to be relaxed and comfortable with your own body. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Brilliant. Um, and speaking of, of movement patterns, there's a lot of debate in the industry at the minute about, you know, prerequisites versus patterns and whether we should take a joint independence approach first or joint interdependence, approach, you know, approach. So you get people who will say you need to make sure that the, the joint functions like a, like a joint and has all the, the normal ranges of motion. And they get other people who say, well, no, you, you know, you should be isolating joints. You should do full movement patterns first. What, what's your approach? What's your thoughts on that? Um, I, I would say I have a very um, mixed approach. Um, I think fundamentally, you know, all joints need to be able to move freely in space. That's the most fundamental thing that they need to require the full range of motion available. Mm -hmm. However, you know, it's very individual. If, if this person has done, for example, a throwing sport their whole life, then you would expect their right shoulder, for example, to be slightly different to their left shoulder. So taking these things into consideration is very important. Um, a lot of women, they hold their bags on the same shoulder. So, I mean, naturally that side of the shoulder will be slightly different so we're never going to be completely symmetrical our bodies aren't designed symmetrically you know we're we're we're, we're rotational by nature and we're blended through spiral lines so it's important to remember that we are you know asymmetrical in nature so it's important that we don't get so bogged down with the nitty-gritty of does the joint flex to the full degree let's look at let's look at the individual on their personal capabilities and what's their goal you know and I think I split my assessment into two categories so I have an assessment where you know it's the everyday person you know it's it's my family member who, who wants to come and see me and they want to move a bit better and they want to just be free with their movement so that assessment would be slightly softer it will give them some key points to take away and work on then I would have maybe a, you know a high level swimmer and you know they need to get those last last degrees out of, of um, shoulder flexion or they might have had a rotator cuff injury. Therefore, the assessment will reflect their goals and also maybe their previous history of injury. So sometimes it's it's a hybrid and it gets a bit mixed in between. But most of the time, it's either a softer assessment or it's a slightly more driven assessment. And in regards to the approach by approach um, thought process, I think it's quite a, a reductionist approach whereby if we, if we, if we, if we think about like, uh, like um, a car, for example, if a part on the car breaks down, the car and uh, the part gets replaced and then it just goes back into the machine because the machine is quite repetitive by nature, mm -hmm. the machine will just function straight away. If you look at the shoulder and you say, okay, the shoulder hasn't, has limited shoulder flexion, has poor internal rotation, then you're kind of, 
you're having a very zoned in approach and you're not looking at the body as a whole. And when you look at things in isolation, you get an isolated result. Mm -hmm. So I will assess someone's joint first. Does it move freely, actively and passively? And then from there, we'll make a decision to move forward. You know, I think some of the best practitioners I've been lucky to be involved with that balance, um, Trevor Speller and something from him when I watch him do um, work is that he looks at the body as a whole and that he'll look at the person's stress, their sleep, their lifestyle, their history, you know, and all these major factors have such a big implication to how people move. It's not just the fact that they physically can move their joints in yeah. one way or the other. So I think as we know, without saying particular things or names, you know, there's certain systems which are driven around that approach, which is fine and it builds awareness. But I think as a coach, it should be a multifactorial situation and you, and you should look at the body um, from, a, from a sort of panoramic view and take into all these bigger, um, bigger areas to look at and also to revise in it and then advise one to move forward. Yeah, you and I are in complete agreement there. Absolutely. Um, my approach is very similar. You know, I'll test each joint independently, but then I'll ask, what does the person actually want to achieve? And to give an example, there was a big hoo-ha on social media a while ago about the Cossack squat and you had people saying you can develop the cost the Cossack squat by doing the Cossack squat which makes sense but then you had people on the other side of the fence saying well if a person doesn't have for example enough ankle dorsiflexion the body's going to compensate in that pattern in a way that might damage that joint or other parts of the body and I actually had a client come to me who had their right ankle reconstructed because it they broke it in a, in a football accident or a soccer accident if you're an american listening in um mm. and they wanted to develop the side split and the cossack squat is fantastic for side split development but there was no way in hell they were going to get that ankle dorsiflexion mechanically it just wouldn't work mm. how their ankle was reconstructed there was metal in the joint and so if i was going to take that that kind of that myopic view on on joint function I, i'd end up saying to them well you're never going to do the cossack squat so pick something else what i did was i got a wedge and place it under the foot yeah, you know, so that they could then get the required movement without necessarily having to deal with with ankle dorsiflexion. So mm -hmm. I think there are intelligent workarounds to de to develop patterns, and at the same time you can then say their ankle was, you know, a normal human ankle and didn't have all this metal in it. You could develop that ankle flexibility at the same time mm -hmm. while still working yeah. on the pattern. So it doesn't have to be an either or situation. But uh, yeah, no, you exactly. and I completely totally agree on that. Yeah. yeah. And I think, and I think even if you've got, you know, and if you've had the unfortunate example where you've had an injury or, you know, I think with the ankle, you can get a cyst in the ankle as well, which can block flexion, you know, and things like that. And there's so many great movements, which you, you can do as a human around these potential restrictions, which is amazing. So I think, you know, when, if people say to me, oh, I'm injured only, I, I can't move and I'm really um, not feeling great about training. It's like, okay, well, Let's look at it as like, you can't do this at the moment, but these are so many other areas we can do to develop the rest of your body and the way your body works, it will cross over naturally into that side anyway. So, you know, nothing is lost or gained from an injury. It's like, learn from the injury, educate yourself on the injury, you know, and develop other areas which you put off for a long time, like your flexibility and things like that. So I think there's always an opportunity to do something else. Um, and the joint by joint approach is, the way I think my mind works in terms of movement, I have a bit of a dancer in me, so I'm a bit more flowy sometimes, but I also have the rugby player in me, so I like the structural stuff, so I kind of sit in between. So I like the, the scientific side of movement, but I also think there's a spiritual side to movement as well, and that requires empowering people to let go, feel their body, um, be soft and be hard. So soft where you can play on the floor, be like a child, um, and then hard where you want to do your isometrics, you want to be strong, be active, be dynamic. So having that cross between the, 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 the two systems is vitally important. Um, and that will be dependent on who I'm coaching. Some people are more driven to be more stronger and harder. So it's about coaching the right person to enable them to feel both, which I think is essential. Yeah, brilliant. You touched on something as well when you, you said that humans are, you know, we develop through rotation and you know, you talked about spiral lines, um, which fascia plays a large part in. Mm. Um, so what are your thoughts on the increasing awareness that fascia plays in human movement? And do you think the industry, the fitness industry is still a long way from catching up to where we should be? Um, 
it's for me personally a very quite u- unique new area to look at and um, it's only been really in the last year I've really looked at fascia and I um, just want to reference the people I've learned from um, so Julian Baker um, he's a really great guy he does a lot that he's done a lot of amazing fascial um, webinars recently so if anyone's interested in cadavers and dissection go on to functional fascia you can grab those and they're great to look at and it'll give you a really eye-opening experience to actually what the human body looks like in real life yeah and i was going to go to arizona to do the fst course with chris and Anne frederick um unfortunately i couldn't go obviously because of the situation so i i think it's a it's definitely a great system and, and i think it's it's definitely something that trainers need to be aware of um so just to talk a little bit more about the fascial system so the fascial system is basically a net which which um, um passes through our tissue, through our nervous system and penetrates straight to the bone. Within the, the fascial system, at, at, they have uh, interoceptors. So they have lots of sensory feedback which run into our brain. A lot of these interoceptors are actually, I think, um, it's like they're 10 times the amount of um, normal receptors which muscle tissue has. So fascia has these amazing sensory organs which provide afferent and efferent feedback to our nervous system, which is brilliant for movement. Mm-hmm. and I believe, while well, it's been told that up until 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, uh, fascia wasn't looked at. So fascia was just kind of put in the bin, and dis- dis- disregarded. And now obviously the that fascia is this organ in itself. Mm-hmm. And it's fluid structure, which runs through the muscle tissue in, into the deep tissue through superficial layers. Yeah. And if, if you look at fascia and cadavers, you'll see that there's layers and layers of tissue and pleura before you'll reach the deep tissue itself, mm-hmm. which suggests that therapists and ma- manual therapists, having learned from the um, original anatomy textbooks, that it's been c- kind of, again, reductionist and it's, and it's been poorly illustrated, whereby the body is perfect. So you have these striations of the muscle, you have the joints all in the same place. And so when people are pal- palpating or that they're using palpation exercises, they are simply sometimes, you know, working over superficial layers of tissue. They are not really getting into the deep tissue. So, you know, if I was ever with a practitioner now and they were doing some hip flexor work with me and they had the elbow in my hip and they were saying, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to release your hip flexor now. And I say, well, look, you're quite, quite far off. I mean, the, the psoas muscle is a deep muscle. It's right attaches point into the spine. And there's nine or so layers of tissue before you even reach this tissue. So, you know, the webbing will cross through into, into the deep tissue, so I'm sure it will affect it. But I think it's unfair for people to say and to sell, you know, products off the basis of the fact that they are going to release, do deep, deep tissue work when you, you can't see inside someone's body. You can, it's, you know, it's, it's good guesswork, but it's not so accurate for you to say. And I think, you know, from researching it and looking at the system, it's really, really interesting. And, Fascial tightness is quite interesting. So, you know, when people are sat in prolonged positions, the fascial system is looked at as water. So water can become fibrous. And this is almost like a, you know, like a stiffness in itself. So it almost pins down. So when you start to move freely, you get in this movement of lightness, um, you know, and that's stimulating fascial movement. So that is your water, tra- and so the fascial cells transporting water through your body. And that is the feeling of feeling looser, you know, and obviously develop to, to develop then more movement specifically that you would then move into more isometric and dynamic stretching, et cetera. But just to feel better doing general movement patterns where you're extending your limbs to their outer ranges for about five to 10 minutes, you'll feel much better. Mm-hmm. So that is a case that your fascia has become stagnant and it's become stiff and still from being in, in one prolonged position. So um, I think, that pretty much covers a lot of the fascia stuff. And I think it's a wonderful thing. And I think as a coach, I think it's important to recognize that and to do a little bit of research and to look at some of those cadavers, you know, in, in, in it's so interesting. You see the body in its truest form mm-hmm. um, and the body isn't this perfect, you know, the, the, the gluteus isn't this perfectly shaped muscle, which runs into the hamstring. You know, it's this one complete layer of tissue. So, Again, if you're thinking about movement and kinetic chains and you're doing stability exercises, 
it's almost like a bit of a myth to train the core in isolation because the trunk muscles are blending through into the upper back and down into the into the gluteus. So it's very important as a coach that yes, having the use in isolation, but have the panoramic view again that the body is a whole and you need to train the body as a whole through kinetic chains. Yeah, brilliant. I like that answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. Got a lot more than I was expecting. That was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, um, yeah, I just blabbed. No, oh, please, please talk away. Um, <laughs> you talk, you, I mean, you talk about cadavers. I think what would be a really interesting um, bit of research, and I don't know if this has happened already, but to compare, you know, a cadaver of somebody who lives the modern sedentary lifestyle to somebody who's got more of that kind of hunter-gatherer lifestyle, which is what we evolved mm. from, and just see how things like the fascia differ between the two. I think there'll be some quite remarkable, um, mm. you know, discoveries there. But um, just for people who are listening or watching, um, a really, really good book to get started on the subject is um, Anatomy Trained by Tom mm. Myers, which um, kind of is what I think kickstarted a lot of interest into fascia and fascial lines. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of development now in research regarding myofascial force transmission. In, in the fact that, you know, the contractile components of the muscles may not be, you know, the sole generator of tension in, in, in the body. Um, mm. I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely going to shape the future of, of health and fitness for sure. Definitely. Um, and I think it's just a great way to look at the body in general. You know, it's just, again, just using everything which we're part of, you know, and it's just taking everything into consideration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, talking about fascia, um, one of the most common treatments for fascial tightness that people claim is, is mm. self myofascial release. So I, I think one of the things that people use to address that is foam rolling. So obviously in recent years, there's been this craze about foam rolling and smashing tissues. Um, what's your thought on that, you know, the use of foam rolling and, and some of the strategies that people use? I think um, I think it might say a lot about me that I don't and have never used it, you know, good or bad. It's something which I've personally never been interested in because I just find it too passive and just not very interesting to do. Um, I think because like what we spoke about then, about the, the effect really that you have on the deep tissue when, when there's just passive movement is not, it's not a great deal. So, yes. you know, if you're taking a foam roller, which is you know, this big and you're rolling over your quadriceps to relieve tightness, then because the, you know, the, the surface area is so big and you know, the adhesion or the, the tightness or the restriction, whether it's psychological, if it's even there, who knows, mm. whether it's a nervous system distress on that day, you know, we just, you just don't know. And I just think it, it provides the nervous system and the, you know, the individual with a temporary window or relief, mm -hmm. um, which they, you know, you see people doing you know, foam rolling before you do squats, which is quite ridiculous. But you know, it's just that they're kind of doing, like you say, the smashing tissue. Don't really know why. Is it, there's a poor education around it? You know, there's obviously heavy marketing which goes into foam rolling. Mm -hmm. um, people don't really know why it works or how it works, but they feel the temporary relief and. Is that because that they just move fascia, move water quite quickly, and that's produced a freedom quite quickly, which has given them a feeling of lightness. Yeah. You know, have they stimulated some of the vagus nerve, you know, and that and that stimulates some feeling of lightness as well. And that runs through from you, you get a stimulation of the vagus nerve from things like massage, meditation, slow and passive mobilization. So if you you know you go and have a massage, you feel great. And that stimulated a lot of the vagal nerve activity, um, and that's you know that's crossed into feeling a little bit more relaxed. You wake up the next day. Unfortunately, most massages wear off quite quickly, mm -hmm. so it provides a window to do something structurally quite good. However, there is obviously not a lot of information or education on how to really use that. You know, I think most of what most of the work which gets done in the treatment room or as coaches even, you know, we, we don't have a great effect during the session. It's when the empowerment comes after the session. So when you know, there's an opportunity for the individual to train those ranges or, you know, if they've had a massage, it might be quite good to, to, to the day after to do some loaded work, for example, if they're a little bit freer, the body's a little bit looser, so things like that. So it's a tool. I, didn't, I wouldn't say it structurally changes much, but it gives you the feeling of lightness. Um, yeah, it's it's it's. A, I think it's quite overused. I think. Yeah, I I agree, and it, it definitely it's one of those things where it works for some people, doesn't work for others. Um, you know, you look at the research. We know that it creates a temporary increase in range of motion, which you can then mm. like, say creates a window that people can can then start to 
to introduce loading. I don't think you should foam roll and then go for a, a triple body weight personal record in the squat, for example. You know, I think that's just yeah. you're you're asking for trouble there. But um, certainly, if somebody is has no squat to speak of whatsoever, if they do a bit of foam rolling and that releases them to start developing the pattern, I think that's a good strategy. But like you say, it's you know it's been treated almost as like a panacea. You know, a, 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 mm -hmm. like yeah, a, definitely a fix all, and it's just it's not it's not you know. Um, so obviously with the lockdown, a lot of people have moved into online coaching and online training. Do you think this is going to play a larger part in, in the future of fitness or do you think it'll kind of go back to the way things were before the lockdown? I think it will. And I think, you know, I think for myself personally, I was quite skeptical about, um, coaching online because, you know, when you coach in person, you get all the senses and you get this real buzz and this rapport with the client and it's great and you're, and you're on a journey even in the session, but having the, the physical screen, I was a bit, oh, you know, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but it's actually worked really, really well. And um, it's enabled for myself and I'm sure other coaches to connect with people outside of the usual, the usual circle, you know, like, for example, like ourselves talking right now, I'm not sure we would have done this if this wouldn't have happened altogether. So it's, it's I've, I've found it really inspiring in that way to connect with people who you wouldn't have usually connected with. I think... For me personally, I'm going to go and do a more of a balance when this is all calmed down. Um, I'll do part online, part face to face. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely the way I think the future will go um, mm -hmm. and how technology will gradually, I'm sure, evolve again, which is scary, um, that it will get even more real. I'm not sure how that will happen, whether we'll have like headsets on one day and we'll be yeah. kind of like together, you know. Um, so, it's exciting and I think it allows people time because this period has been really good for a mental reset and it's been a nice time to reflect on, on your current lifestyle and how much you're kind of draining your battery and I think when people have to be at a certain physical point that time and travel is tiring um, and I think especially just using London as an example a lot of clients will rush to see me they'll rush back and it's just like when they come into the session, I feel like, you know, I'm having to do a lot of breath work to just bring their nervous system down quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But now, because they're at home and they're not traveling, they're not on the tube and they're not in this congested environment, I feel like actually the sessions have improved slightly for mm -hmm. some people. Uh, and the focus for me and them has been great because it's been so one-on-one -on -one the whole time. There's not been a physical space distraction. There's not been other coaches or physios in the same area. It's just been very direct and very goal driven i think a balance is great to have going forward yeah. um but i think in in the grand scheme of things i think the fitness industry has adapted pretty well pretty quickly i mean you saw people obviously improvising and adapting very quickly you know doing lots of classes and doing online stuff which is great and um it's helped i think educate people a lot as well i think people have had to educate themselves they're, they're not in their usual gym environment they're not you know, going to that same place, having the same session by the same trainer, they've had to then go, okay, I'm going to have to maybe do a little bit more reading myself and um, mm -hmm. how my own body works, which is, which is the most important thing. That's what we want as coaches is to empower people. Yeah. Brilliant. I like that answer. That's really good. And I agree. I think it's the way it's going to go in the future is it's going to be a blend of, of online and, um, you know, in-person coaching. Um, a lot of people have said it's just accelerating the inevitable really. Um, mm. And it's nothing, nothing to be scared of either. And, you know, it's, it's not going to no, get anybody out no. of the job. If anything, it's going to make you know a larger clientele or a larger client base more accessible to trainers. I think. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, time for the fun question. Um, if you were yeah. stranded on a on a desert island, then you can only take one book, one piece of gym equipment, and one type of food or drink. What would they be? So the book would be uh, Shoe Dog by um, Philip Knight. So that's the Nike, that's, that's, that's the Nike boss and CEO. And um, he was, I mean, I'm, I'm always draped in Nike. So I was like, I probably should find out about the story behind this. Um, and it was just so inspiring. And his journey and his relentless efforts to kind of create Nike and the way it was formed. And I think it was interesting, the skill set he basically brought on. So he didn't just go for sportsmen all the time. He brought on accountants and he, his vision and the way he picked skills out of people was really interesting mm -hmm. and the way he built his business from his parents room you know, he was getting shoes over from uh, china and japan and then you know it was they were originally called blue ribbon it's just so interesting i won't spoil the book for anyone who hasn't seen it or haven't read it sorry 
Um, so yeah, we recommend that. As, and it's quite funny, he's, he's got some good bits in it as well. Uh, and then food wise, I'm a massive sucker for Greek yogurt. So um, I have Greek yogurt a lot, uh, not on its own, so I might have to take honey or something to sweeten it with. But yeah, I'm a massive Greek yogurt fan. Uh, and then exercise wise, I take a skipping rope. Mm-hmm. Um, just so I like skipping. Um, and then I would just do all my training and movement body weight. So probably hang on some trees. Yeah. Great answers. Yeah. Um, before we finish, um, can you just tell the audience where they can find you and how they can get in touch with you? Um, so if you, for in-person sessions, I'm in uh, Southwest London at Ballad Physiotherapy uh, in Clapham North. Um, for online training, um, my Instagram is ollifrostpt um, or ollifrost.com. And then for the move work, uh, it's just move45 on Instagram. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out for movement courses in some workshops in some other bits and pieces, hopefully, which will be coming up in the next couple of months. Great. I'll put all those um, links in the description box as well, all the captions on, on social media. Ollie, mate, it's been a great, uh, great interview. Really appreciate your answers. You've, you've given people a lot of food for thought there. Appreciate that, mate. Thank you for your time. Cheers, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Take it easy, mate. See you later. Thank you. See you later. Yeah, bye.